So today uh, I'm going to talk about the year of living COVIDly. This is going to be a combination of my professional and personal experiences and observations um, over the last year and three months. Uh, this is the week a year ago, if you go back and do like I did and look at your, at least when I looked at my emails, everything came down between March 9th and March 16th. Um, as far as the uh, huge changes in how we work and how we live. Um, so it's been a lot happening since then, um, but that's what I'll be covering primarily is my personal um, observations and experiences. So let's go back to sharing the screen. There's that. Come up here to this. Not to that, to this. And is that looking correctly? Okay, I can't remember who wrote The Year of Living Dangerously, but this is where that comes from. <laughs> Um, before we go on my personal little insights, I'd like to ask you to do, we're going to ask for three questions or three times to do this. And that is, if you could each take a moment now and write down your top five pivots. In other words, changes to, in how we as a society have viewed and have dealt with the virus or how we've lived or however else you'd like to do that. What are the four or five or six big pivots that you have experienced? And the next one is take a moment to write down your top five divots, pieces of your personal life that were scooped up and flung while swinging at the pandemic. And as with a divot, these are pieces you might want to put back in place if you can, although like a lot of divots, they don't end up being able to do that. And finally, if you could take a moment and think or write down your top five screw ups and how we've dealt with the disease, things we should do differently next time around, because I'm pretty sure there's gonna be a next time around, so. I want to do that. I wanted to give you a chance to do that before I go through mine so that mine don't unduly influence yours. Uh, there's a sense of historical inevitability about all this. And unfortunately, I'm not a big fan of historical inevitability. We have choices, we have decisions personally and culturally and nationally, and we can't undo them, but it's not like they were inevitable. So on January 1st of 2020, if you can think back that long ago, um, we knew it was an election year, but we didn't know who the Democratic parties would be. We knew it was gonna be a census year, and that's a big deal, especially in the United States, because the census is a basis on which we uh, apportion members of the House of Representatives and how we do likewise at the state level for legislatures. And it was gonna be an Olympics year in Tokyo. My family and I were in Jerusalem. We were gonna be flying back on the third or fourth. I can't remember. I do remember waking up the morning that we were gonna fly back, however, to find out that the US had assassinated Iran's head military officer. And it's always nice to be getting on a plane in Israel after the US has assassinated a leading person from Iran. Uh, we made it back fine. January 5th, the World Health Organization alerted the world of an outbreak of a new virus in Wuhan, China. On January 11th, China reported its first death. January 20th, there were cases confirmed in Japan, South Korea, and Thailand. And on January 21st, we had our first case in the United States. And that was in Washington state from somebody who had come back from visiting in Wuhan. And this is what I remember going, oh my, when I heard on the NPR, the Wisconsin Public Radio coverage, uh, Wisconsin Public Radio 
station of NPR's coverage that China had quarantined an entire city of 11 million people. And I will admit this is a city of 11 million people, which is bigger than any city in the United States that I had never heard of. But I thought, wow, how do you quarantine a city of 11 million people? So this is that story uh, from NPR. Uh, we were already calling it the coronavirus. The whole railway station here was empty. That was the point of the picture. And that was pretty sobering. A week later, there's a panel of experts um, at UW-Madison's Health Science Learning Center. I went to that. Uh, I think there were nine experts. Each was given five minutes. And I've never been to a place where everybody did their talk in four and a half minutes and then got done. It was very impressive. Uh, the major thing I got out of that was they were very serious about it. And the big thing was they were saying nice things about the Chinese and their level of cooperation, especially in sharing the sequence, the sequence of this RNA virus had been published uh, several days earlier and people were already at work on that. And this is the story that came out on January 31st by Kelly April Terrell here at Un University of Wisconsin-Madison Communications. And I think um, here's the things that I keep in mind that at the time 200 people was a ton and 10,000 people was a ton. And um, this is very early days. These are numbers that no longer would numb us. And here's something I thought was really pretty amazing. Um, they're already gearing up for this. People had been worried about this kind of virus because it was a SARS type virus. And we were comparing it to influenza. And at that time, we still thought we'd better be more worried about influenza than this, sorry, this coronavirus. Um, and that was a reasonable thing to do because we had a bad influenza year already going on. And this is the other thing that I got out of that story was that already people were working on vaccines even if they didn't have the virus in hand because they had the sequence of the viral rna they could extrapolate and figure out what the protein would be and they could start designing and building and testing vaccines against a virus that they never had actually in hand and so that was pretty astonishing to me The other thing that they brought up at this meeting was there were gonna be basically two epidemics. One was of the virus and the other was what now we call an infodemic. And that is the idea that people are spreading inf misinformation. And if it's maliciously spread, then it's disinformation. And this is something that we've had to deal with on several levels throughout the last year, both misinformation and disinformation. On January 30th, the World Health Organization declared a global health emergency. It's not quite calling it a pandemic, but it's all hands on deck. And then on February 2nd, uh, announcement of the first known death from COVID outside of China, and this was a person in the Philippines. So this month is gonna be a month where a lot of things change. This doctor, Dr. Li, was a key figure in raising the alarm in China and also helped alert folks in the West about this. And the tragedy is in part, um, that he, not, that he got the virus, got the disease and died from it. 
and we look to him as a, a noble character here in the West. I'm not sure how he's viewed currently in China. So now we have this issue of how do we go about naming this thing because we called it novel coronavirus, if you can remember, and there were a lot of really good great jokes about Corona beer and all this good stuff at first. And there were two things that we had to name. One was the virus and the other was the disease. The World Health Organization gets to name the diseases and they named it COVID-19 to stand for coronavirus disease 19 because it started in 2019. Um, at first everybody styled it with all caps and then they reduced it to like a regular name, capital C at the beginning and COVID-19. And then the World Health Organization intentionally did not use any place name, not any animal, no nationality. And the whole idea was to avoid stigmas um, from the naming, the names assigned to previous viruses. So some of you know that we have, a, there's a virus out there called um, lacrosse virus because it was first found in lacrosse, Wisconsin. And that's kind of cool when you have a place that you know and there's a virus name for you, but it also backfired because of the racism and um, engendered by calling it the Chinese virus. At this time, 99% of all cases known were in China. And the virus itself was eventually named, sorry, I didn't get the SARS-2 COVID, I didn't get that quite finished there. Um, only virologists refer to the virus distinctly. Most of us just call it now the COVID virus. Um, another group, group of virologists gets to name the viruses and that's an important dis distinction for them. But for most of us, we just call it the COVID virus. And then this was an interesting thing to keep, you keep wondering how things are gonna change and shift. Um, there was a case of a, an infection in a Hong Kong high rise that was among the earliest indications that the virus might spread far by air. And there's this distinction between um, airborne and aerosol. And that's a big difference because of what you need to do to protect yourselves and your family and your population. At this time, the cruise ships began to be denied entry because if you had one or two people on board, it could very quickly spread through cruise ships. And that became an interesting international issue of how long do you keep people on the ship? How do you provision the ship while people are stuck on the ship? And once you let them off, how long do you uh, continue to trace and track them? Uh, these are really hard questions very early on. Then February 23rd and 24th, Italy and Iran became major centers of the disease. Um, this was a big deal in part because Iran is under a long running blockade uh, from the US so that the US would not permit any uh, medicines or medical supplies into Iran. Italy was a big deal because we could get full coverage of what was going on and the fact that so many old folks in Italy were dying at such high numbers. It was really devastating to the, uh, especially the folks in Northern Italy. And then February 29th, yes, 2020 was a leap year, happy day. Um, that was the day of the first US death reported. Now on a personal note, on March 4th, Catherine Schmidt spoke to Wednesday night at the lab and she spoke on respiratory viruses of children and adults. And I went back and recorded the, uh, transcribed the introduction because it was one of my finest moments in the intro. I said, uh, the focus of Catherine's talk is gonna be on influenza. It's gonna be interesting to see how the numbers stack up uh, to this competing virus we have going on right now. I think influenza might win. In other words, at that time, I thought influenza would cause more deaths in the United States because a bad year of influenza in the United States could cause 50,000 to 100,000 deaths. And I was wrong. Then we started seeing uh, panic buying worldwide as fears of quarantine spread. 
uh, one of the first big things to get canceled was South by Southwest in Austin, which is a capital city, home to a major research university. Um, and it's, Madison has many parallels to Austin. And it was pretty amazing to see that South by Southwest got canceled um, that early. At that time, we had 97,000 infections worldwide and 3,300 deaths globally. We're over 1.6 million deaths today. On March 7th, Italy locked down Milan and Venice and much of the north of Italy. And I had been to Italy in 2017 and had a, um, I'd been to Milan, I hadn't gone to Venice, but it was one of these things that travel helps you imagine. I've never been to China, but I've been to Italy and I was just sitting there thinking, how are they gonna shut down these huge cities and these little villages and everything in between? Uh, things started hitting home financially with the stock market. And on several occasions, this, the stock market was down enough that it triggered um, the automatic suspensions of trade. And one of those days was March 9th, where it dropped 7% at the beginning. That was also the day of the second confirmed case in Wisconsin. And also the day that the Milwaukee Bucks, who were having one of the great seasons ever, uh, seven of their players didn't play. And the Bucks lost 109 to 95. Now, one of the things that struck me in looking back over this year, both from the COVID point of view and from the uh, social justice point of view is the role that professional athletes and professional athletic uh, leagues have played and uh, how they responded or didn't respond depending on the league uh, is a pretty big deal. We'll see this again in the summer. So here's David Leonard of the New York Times saying, well, um, here's some things that you might want to be able to do. And the key thing to me is uh, with so little guidance on what to do because the national government was still having a pretty clear hands-off approach. This is a state and local issue and uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, it was already a, a national issue that so few tests were available, that we had so few personal protection equipment, masks, ventilators, all these things. Um, and, and that was only gonna grow worse. This is the week where my email inbox is dominated by questions about whether various outreach programs would continue despite the growing concerns about COVID. And even right through middle of the afternoon of March 11th, I thought they would. Um, I'm an extension specialist and on March 10th, extension sent us an email asking everybody to compile a list of programs that were planned and those that had already been interrupted by COVID. So they wanted to document the impact of uh, the epidemic on our statewide programming. It's always interesting to have a country that's run by a person who has a PhD in physical chemistry, and that would be Angela Merkel and Germany. And she was very forthcoming in this estimate that up to 70% of the population would be infected. Um, and that they were taking this very seriously, even though it was early days, um, they could see across the border what was happening in Italy and their approach was distinctly different from that of the United States and some other countries. Back here at home, this is the week that was. So this is a week ago exactly today. This is March 10th today. March 11th was the Wednesday last year. Um, the chancellor issued an advisory that the work would go on. It was possible to work at home if you wanted, but not mandatory. Um, that Wednesday when Adel was on and off and on and off and finally it was off and that was 
to me the right thing to do by six o'clock at night based on all the stuff that has come down that day. And Wednesday night at the lab went on hiatus until the first week of October. That was also the day that Engineering Expo was canceled. That was supposed to be April 4th and 5th. That was the day that Science Expeditions Campus Wide Open House was canceled. That was supposed to be the 4th, 5th, and 6th. Uh, that's an open house that I helped start back in um, April of 2003. And that was a big personal blow um, to lose that. We had our last Plato Frontiers in Life Sciences on March 11th. Um, because that was from one to two. Um, and while that was going on, some of these advisories were coming down and additional advisories were coming down. And so that was the last one until we resumed in the fall and we've resumed in the fall by the Zoom as we were doing now. On March 11th, the NBA suspended the season. Tom Hanks announced that he'd gotten COVID while in Australia. The following day, my boss told Liz, Jesse and me, um, should, that that Thursday would likely be the last day that we'd be working at the Biotech Center building until April 13th. And that was true, except for the April 13th part. This was also the day that Governor Evers declared the first emergency. Uh, the following day, he closed schools no later than Wednesday, March 18th. Almost everybody didn't go back to school on Monday, March 16th, excuse me, that was unintended. And the Madison Metropolitan School District announced that they intended to reopen on April 6th. So this was all a big deal to me because I had a, my daughter was a freshman at West High School, my son was a seventh grader at Hamilton Middle School, and all these things were affecting me and how I was going to be able to work and move forward. And then one of the toughest things was uh, that Friday night, the state squirt hockey tournament was canceled. My son was on one of the teams that was going to go. He was one of the goalies. And uh, that was a long night of tears at my house. It was not easy to watch people's uh, long hoped for events get canceled at the last minute. On March 14th, I wrote a note to myself on jolts, and this was just a real quick note to myself, but I thought it was worth sharing in the sense that I, it showed where my mind was um, a year ago this time. So with schools closed and the kids home indefinitely, all dates are indefinite now, um, it's time to draw on experience from other jolts. And some of those would be the, um, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, which I barely remember, uh, the Kennedy assassination of 63, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King in April of 68 and of Robert Kennedy in June of 68 and the riots in August of 68, the Chicago uh, meeting of the Democratic National uh, Convention. Um, May 4th of 70 was Kent State, um, Watergate, and especially the unprecedented resignation of the President of the United States um, made on August 8th of 1974, effective August 9th. Um, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq in July and August of 1990, because I was actually in France, on my way to France as that was all happening and that was um, a very sobering time. Uh, and then the US and other allies uh, counterattack into Kuwait in January of 1991. And then the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks the following month in 2001. So this is, um, the level of jolt that I thought we were going through. So now we go to this period of zoom and gloom, the transition to working at home, uh, stocking up supplies, streets were pretty empty, daily updates or more often, and just waiting to see what would happen next. We had widespread cancellations here. Um, 
contradictory or quickly changing announcements. For example, on March 14th, the school district said it was uh, not moving to online instruction. Um, but when it did reopen, it was online. And notice we had only 27 cases on March 14th, and six of them from Dane County. So you could still say, oh, this isn't much, but this is the nature of uh, a new infectious disease that spreads exponentially. So this is an email from a friend of mine at 247 on Saturday, March 14th. And this was a big deal to me because it starts showing how not only did I lose all my, and most other people did too, um, lose your professional face-to-face -face contacts, but we were starting to lose our neighbors and friends' personal contacts. And this was a pretty cool email. I think it was interesting that he said, if in a week or so we don't see a bunch of cases in our area, then it might be a different story. So even at that time, we were still hoping this might only be two or three or four weeks and we'd be able to get back to normal. Some new words came into the lexicon, flatten the curve. The whole idea that we were taking all these extreme steps so early was not that it would stop the disease from eventually spreading far and wide, but that it would slow the speed and the surge, the literal tsunami that would fall on our emergency rooms, our intensive care units, um, our hospitals, our clinics. And that was a very effective, in my opinion, not only does the phrase make sense, but so too did the graph showing why it was important to flatten the curve and that all these actions we were taking to slow the virus were worth it, even though it was very early days. Um, as a person trained a little bit in virology and a little bit in health, um, it's plant health, but we use words like quarantine um, to, to hear how different words like quarantine, which is you keep somebody who's healthy but may have been exposed separate versus isolate, that's a person who's known to be sick and you keep them apart and self-isolate, which seemed to mean different things to different people. This is one of my first tough uh, examples of how we're going to communicate this effectively so that people know what these words mean and can take the appropriate actions. I'd never heard of, excuse me, I'd never heard of PPE before, but I think that stands for personal protective equipment. It's a big deal in hospitals and clinics and other places. We didn't have enough of it. They also use this word respirator. And I thought a respirator was something that you put over your face like this and it had big filters on the side. But that was also the word that they use for an N95 face mask, which just looks like a white face mask that sits over your face, but it removes 95% of particles of a particular size. So just being able to get the distinctions accurate on mask versus respirator, and then uh, later at the end of the month, face covering was a big deal because those are distinctions that can make a difference. Um, and using the right words makes a difference. Then there's also the issue of whether the virus was airborne or aerosol. And the big deal is the whole idea of two meters or six feet and how far, if you sneeze or cough, how far did the droplets go and how big are the droplets or more likely how small are the droplets that still have infectious virus in them? Because if it's an aerosol, then you have the issue that you have infectious virus particles not dropping to the ground in a few moments or minutes within six feet, but remaining suspended in the air for many minutes or hours at a level that's enough to be infectious. And I think this is one of the big, big pivots for me was going from a huge focus on hand washing and not touching your eyes and all these things which are still valid but the it made a much bigger deal to see the virus as something that's in the air whether it's six feet or 12 feet or 21 feet away to be much more conscious of the 
air. Another part of the lexicon was um, symptomless versus asymptomatic versus presymptomatic. Um, I was impeded a little bit in this because in plant pathology, which I'm a plant pathologist, we have definitions for these words. The medical folks and the public health folks have their own definitions and they don't always mix well. So I had to learn what the medical folks meant when they said symptomless versus asymptomatic versus presymptomatic. And then another thing that was a particularly fond for me was the analogies to the flu pandemic in 1918 and 1919. Some of the analogies didn't fit so well. Um, some did, but at least when I first took microbiology, my professor pointed out that the 1918-1919 flu was a major failure for microbiology. This had been the golden age of microbiology and many diseases had been uh, figured out as far as what causes them, how they spread, what we can do to stop the diseases, how we can develop assays, how we can come up with vaccines and other treatments. And yet um, at the end of the 1918-1919 flu pandemic, we didn't know what the cause was. We didn't have any assay for it. There was no vaccine and there were no drugs. Um, and that's a huge difference between that experience and what's happened with this pandemic and this virus. Is, uh, to be able to say it was first detected in the middle of December and it was sequenced early in January and that sequence was say shared around the world um, meant that there were ways of assaying, there were ways of detecting, there were ways of starting to develop vaccines um, all very different than my understanding of the experience that we had in 1918, 1919. Uh, that's a repeat of the previous slide. So now we're on to March 15th, that's a Monday. Um, Madison Public Schools closed. All the Dane County schools closed. Stuff that was left at schools were not easy to retrieve because remember when we left on Friday, the 13th, we thought we would be coming back on Monday, the 15th and 16th, because it wasn't until the 17th that the governor's order kicked in. Um, this was a major wrench for people because um, some people had to retrieve important stuff that you keep at school for your kid, including some medicines. Schools are a huge provider of meals and of other types of support services. Um, it was in part because of this closing that UW-Madison expanded its and made it easier for people to choose to work at home to telecommute, but they did not mandate working from home. The university was still open as were all the buildings. Um, and another big deal was child care and elder care was disrupted. And then comes this fog. Um, oh, I must have misspoke March 15th was a Sunday, not a Saturday. So we have an employee here uh, by the name of Paul Purick. He's the guy that makes the little DNA tubes um, that we've had since 1995. Um, Paul has some disabilities. He works for us twice a week. Um, he doesn't use email. And so part of this was how do we keep Paul engaged? And can we have him work from home? Can we um, figure out what the, how long this is gonna last and accommodate Paul appropriately? Um, this is just a little thing. We have a DNA fountain. It has water running through it all the time. If the water evaporates, it burns out the motor and it was a symbolic thing when I had to unplug the DNA fountain because I didn't want it to keep going and run out of water. And it's been unplugged without water since March 15th last year. And it sounds like a little thing, but people have plants at work. I have, uh, and that's a big, for some people that's a big investment in their time and person. Um, I have a plant here that was my mom's hibiscus that I brought into the biotech center in October 
16th of 1995. It had been, it survived happily through two sabbaticals that I took um, in that time because other people took care of it. Um, and this was no small deal that we had to think about, you know, how do we do things as basic as come in and, uh, and to work and keep the plants going. So again, more on Sunday, March 15th, you can see how late at night this was. Um, this was the first sobering thing because there was a possibility of a colleague of mine having got COVID at the time. Of course, we thought COVID was primarily by touch, um, by contact. And so this was the first time that I had to sit there and wonder, did I get infected? Did I get inoculated? So they asked us to uh, self-isolate. That was the word that they used. That night also, or that afternoon, March 15th, um, we usually have our science alliance meetings on Mondays at 10 and I had canceled them because everything was getting shut down. And a colleague of mine said, wow, I can set up this WebEx um, webinar. I was not fluent at all in this stuff. She was, and she set this up and it worked fantastic. Um, so the next day we did have a webinar meeting of the Science Alliance. Um, it was an eye-opening experience for me to see how fast things could shift, that the technology was useful, um, not too daunting, people connected well enough. It was not as good as being there, but it was far, far better than canceling the meeting. And so we have had weekly meetings ever since at 10 o'clock on Mondays. And instead of being an hour long, we cut them back to being 45 minutes long um, because webinars. So this is Monday, March 16th. Stocks fell again. So people are worried about lots and lots of things, their jobs, their retirement, their investments, all this stuff. And this is both in part because of the US economy and because of the Chinese economy. And if you know me, you know, parking is a barometer on campus and you know it's serious when campus parking is free. And this was in part to keep the number of passengers on buses in Madison low. Um, so if you can come to work First of all, stay home if you can. If you need to come to work, we'll let you, we'll make it easier for you to drive to work um, to reduce the possible exposure on public transportation. And this is um, something that we've gone over and over and over again, hopefully for the last time, um, but redefining what staggering is and that Italy reported a staggering 368 deaths in one day. And its toll was up at 1,809. Um, we had, we are now in a place where, gee, we'd be delighted to get back to 368 deaths. And this is also the week that the sports had to recalibrate, both uh, including the professional, the collegiate and the high school because the middle of March is tournament season uh, for many high school sports, uh, certainly for the NCAA hockey and basketball. Um, and how these folks responded, their players, their player associations um, is a very big deal. And how college football later in the summer and fall responded is also a big deal. Um, and we came back to this, that uh, folks in the sports, sometimes it was individual players, sometimes it was player associations, sometimes it was the teams, the role they played um, in the summer during the protests and the riots was a very big deal to me personally to see how they stood up. Um, this is the message that the president, President Trump 
sent out on this Monday, March 16th. Um, it was a Federalist message in the sense that this was something that the states and local governments should be taking care of. Um, and despite it being what most people perceive to be a national crisis, uh, we took a state-by-state -state approach to much of this. So now we're moving into the second half of March. Uh, I think that was the key week that 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th. So now the kids are at home. They don't have any school. They really don't have much in the way of online learning. Uh, it became to be a very big deal to fight for Wi-Fi. My wife works from home all the time. I was working from home all the time. And the kids were trying to watch stuff on Wi-Fi. And I can't imagine what it would be like if I was living in a household that didn't have pretty decent Wi-Fi. And this becomes another um, way that this epidemic uh, had a different bearing on people with different levels of wealth. Another bearing on levels of wealth is we have a rental house. It's a house that we used to live in before we live in the house that we're currently in. This is a time of year where you need to show the house to new people who want to rent the house come the summer. And the folks who were living in the house rightly didn't want to show their house to people who were coming to look at the house. Um, so here we are. I was working at home. I didn't have any Wednesday nights at the lab. I didn't have any Play-Doh, didn't have any field trips didn't have any science expeditions, and I had very restricted access to my office and lab. And I was fine compared to other people who were losing their jobs and having to go deep into their uh, savings, people who got sick, people who died. Um, but this is still not an ordinary week, not an ordinary month for me. Uh, we already started looking forward though on March 16th, we set the dates for science expeditions 2021 for April 9th through the 11th. Those are still the dates for science expeditions, but it's not going to be in person. It's going to be almost all online with a few outdoor events. So here we are a year ago, we were looking forward to a year in advance, thinking we would be back to normal. And here we are a year in advance, knowing we're not anywhere near back to normal. So March 17th, the building basically got shut down. I could no longer go to the building, nor could any of my colleagues unless they had really good reasons to go. This is March 17th. March 17th again, the chancellor sent a message and basically the work from home went from being voluntary to being mandatory, unless one was an essential worker. And this was another example of, whoa, when people get divided into essential and non-essential workers and who gets that moniker and who doesn't um, is a significant deal because it also gets at the issue of which missions of the university are considered essential. Even if you're a mission of the university like public outreach, it's the work isn't considered essential. Um, and so we have not had the public visitors welcome to campus in a year. And I don't know how long it'll be before they will be welcome back. And finally, campus childcare was shut down. All these things are dominoes affecting what we can do and not do. Um, this is the day that they moved all classes to online once the students came back from uh, spring break, which was gonna be the following Monday, March 22nd. And that was also the day that Biden won the primaries in Arizona, Illinois, and Florida and became the clear front runner um, for the Republic, for, excuse me, for the Democratic nominee for the presidential election. March 18th, finally, uh, while all the schools had been closed and all the universities had been largely shut down, this was the first day that um, all the bars and restaurants were shut down in almost all gatherings, including those at churches. And notice the date, it was originally April 6th, um, and back on March 
12th or 13th when the emergency order was first issued and that was designed to last indefinitely. It's not what happened, but that's the ways that things were changing. And on the same day, China reported no new local coronavirus infections. So one of the big shifts or divots to me has been how places like China, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, New Zealand have dealt with COVID compared to how the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy uh, have dealt with it. And back here in the United States the next day, the idea of how do we make sense of what's happening in the US and what isn't making sense. And this was Anthony Fauci going out on the limb saying, let's admit it, it's failing. And he was talking about how long it took for us to get workable coronavirus tests stood up, mass produced and set in place all across the country. And now I'll be speeding up a little bit, um, but the whole thing with masking was very interesting. It wasn't until Friday, April 3rd, that the CDC came out supporting voluntary masking, use of masks in public. Um, if you've traveled to Japan or China, you know that it's considered a courtesy if you're not feeling well to wear a mask. Um, in the United States, that has not been our tradition. And it might be now for about half the country. Um, but that's how long it took for the idea of let's have masks be part of how we respond. Uh, President Trump was part of making this announcement. He emphasized that wearing masks is, is voluntary and that he would not be wearing a mask. And so this became a, a, a physical shibboleth to say which side of the political fences you were on for many people. And we had discouraged healthy Americans from wearing quote unquote masks or respirators because we had so few PPE and every high quality mask that I would be wearing would be a mask that somebody in a hospital would not have available to them. Um, and now the idea that we, it's important to distinguish between an N95 respirator, uh, a surgical mask and a face covering, all three of those are helpful at reducing the spread of the virus um, and distinguishing between those helped to explain why you want to be able to do, encourage people to wear face coverings or surgical masks and try to leave what supply of N95s that were for the people who needed them the most and the, the healthcare workers. Okay, so I'm gonna skip some of this due to time. Uh, the next big thing for me in the spring was I, for the first time I was a poll worker at the April 7th primary, which was a um, presidential primary, several other elections and the Wisconsin Supreme Court race. Um, in the run up to the election, there were issues of voter registration and how much the epidemic had um, impeded voter registration and what kind of actions um, county clerks could take to compensate for the loss of access to registration. Same with early voting. Uh, you probably remember the Democracy in the Park initiative of being able to drop off um, absentee ballots with a poll worker at Parks in, in Madison. And that became very controversial and was taken to the Supreme Court, I believe, Wisconsin Supreme Court. Um, and as far as I know, those votes were upheld. I worked at the polls at Thoreau School. I arrived at six o'clock in the morning and I did not leave until 4.30 the following Wednesday. Uh, it was a very fascinating day to be, remember this is just uh, a few days after masks became something that we're expected to wear, lots of uh, hand sanitizer, maintaining social distance, counting paper ballots, running them through the machines, um, maintaining distance, figuring out how you're going to 
keep enough water and snacks in you. Uh, all those things were very interesting. And because I'd worked there, I had I decided to quarantine myself for eight days in an apartment above Trader Joe's. Um, and that was an apartment that was available to me because it was my mother-in-law's apartment. She was originally going to move out to uh, Wisconsin from Massachusetts um, in January um, or February, and that kind of got delayed. And then I was like, well, why don't we go get her in late February, early March as the epidemic was starting to gain steam. Um, and she decided she would rather stay in Massachusetts and ride out the epidemic there. Um, so these are things that are all affecting me personally. And there's 330 million other people around the country that are going to have very similar stories. Then this was another big pivot. Um, this is an article in the journal Science. Actually, it's a letter to the journal Science. And it's these folks saying, whoa, there's overwhelming evidence in their opinion um, that this virus, SARS-CoV-2, which is the one that causes COVID-19. And we need to be able to figure out the idea that it's not just moving four, five, six feet for a few minutes, but that it can move through the air as very small droplets that can hang around for hours um, and then like smoke be inhaled. So these aerosols, um, the aerosol idea really changed how a lot of people looked at how the virus spreads and therefore what actions you take to prevent the virus and which ones are not so effective. Um, so for me, this was a big shift in how I looked at it. I personally looked at it as being outside was a big deal as opposed to being indoors. I didn't want to be indoors very long with anybody that I wasn't living with. Um, and that anything that we could do to increase ventilation and filtration of the air indoors would be great. And that is different than when you thought it was a virus spread primarily by droplets that would fall to the ground and by surface contact. At the end of May, on May 25th, George Floyd was killed while in custody of Minneapolis police officers. This triggered several weeks of mass gatherings, protests, and riots, including here in Madison. Um, for me, the issue of COVID was never too far away in these actions because as many people pointed out, um, the, the issue of systemic racism and white supremacy was reflected in the disproportionate burden of COVID on black and brown people. Um, and so the, it's interesting to look at the video of protests of uh, these, this era, the summer protests um, and contrast it to say a uh, video of the insurrection on January 6th. And then uh, my family and I got tested for the first time. This is uh, weird for me because I had memories of being, I wasn't tested, but my daughter was very young at the time when she got tested in July 2009 for swine flu. And it was the first time I'd ever seen a six inch swab stuck all the way up the nose of my daughter who was not particularly happy about it. And I was aghast. I had no idea that that's how far that would go. Um, that's, I believe, what they call a nasopharyngeal swab, and that was standard procedure for testing for the swine flu, and it originally it was the original procedure for uh, testing for COVID. Um, people had figured out that actually you don't have to go that deep, and that was a big relief to me and probably to millions of other people, so that when I got tested on July 2nd at the Lion Energy Center at the Dayton County Fairgrounds, um, we were in our car, we had online registered, we had our phones, we had a barcode, and it was a nasal swab and not unpleasant at all. And we tested negative. So that was great. That was the first of many, many tests I've had since then. The aerosol thing was a big deal because it um, bared on, bared, born? It mattered as to what risks um, people were willing to take and how we rank these risks. So here was a risk. Uh, this is from a hospital in St. Louis uh, associated with Washington University. And from August 17th, 
And if you look at these things, this is with people wearing masks and practicing social distancing. So there's certain things that you might be able to do um, with a low level, low level of risk, colored green by the hospital people naming, it's pretty okay to try. But look what happens if you have nobody wearing masks and not practicing social distancing. All these things become yellow and orange. A few become red, including some of these things that became very contentious and the point of lawsuits. August was also the time that universities were reopening campuses based on plans that they had announced in June or July. Um, important to me was that the Madison schools decided to cancel fall athletics, including girls swimming, because my daughter was on that team sport and I didn't think we'd be able to do any um, family vacations in August because of that. But the Dane County numbers were climbing up in part as a result of UW students coming back to live in apartments. Only about 20% of UW students live in dorms. So it's not like they all came back on the day that the dorms opened up. There were a lot, and I live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of rentals and there were a lot of college students all through the summer and especially in August as they started to come back. So I decided to take a road trip using uh, COVID precautions that I showed two slides ago. And what I ran into was some pretty interesting distinctions between COVID precautions and COVID theater and things that people would do because they thought it looked good versus things that actually made a difference. So this was the road trip that I took with my daughter and my son in our Siena van. And we went from, this was 21, 22 days of camping or staying in uh, hotels that supposedly had good COVID productions. And we started in Madison and oh, these are all the places that I was able to go and show my kids and take them to and get to see some great, great stuff. Um, some wonderful camping. Um, we became very fluent with drive-ins. Uh, we never ate in a restaurant. We never went inside any museums. Um, at Mesa Verde, um, they'd canceled all the ranger led tours. Um, in along Salinas and Big Sur and Highway One, we were there for the days of orange skies from the fires. And so it was bizarre to be driving through um, John Steinbeck territory and um, Salinas and seeing these incredibly productive agriculture lands with people out there working in them who had to deal both with COVID issues and with um, very heavy smoke and toxins in the air. Um, Again, this is the weird thing about the pandemic is that it amplified the other things that were going on. By the time we got back to Madison, there had been a significant rift in the town and gown relations, um, unlike anything I remember in, since the time I've lived in Madison starting in January of 1982. This is a letter that the um, Dane County Board sent to the public health people and to the chancellor saying, whoa, uh, we're not very happy with what's happened. Um, we have high rates of um, infection and you're having all these folks move back into town. And the tone was, well, the statements was the things that you're doing are inherently dangerous and worse. Um, you're not taking effective actions to slow the spread. And in part because of this, um, we ended up having a new order that canceled classes for schools in Aldane County schools, requiring all districts to return to virtual learning. So um, the decisions and policies and practices of UW-Madison affected the community at large, and we ended up 
not going back to in-person classes. UW-Madison did for a while, but then the high rates uh, drove them back to having um, primarily online. So at the fall, we were able to start firing up um, some of the programming. So this is back to my professional angle. Um, I was able to work with my colleagues at University Place, um, Tina Hauser and her crew at PBS Wisconsin. Um, we were able to get new equipment that would allow us to drop this box of equipment off at the home of presenters. They would record the presentation. We would watch and monitor the, uh, and engineer the presentation, but we were all uh, watching everything remotely from our own homes. Um, we were able to start having a, the workflow knit together so that we could have live Zoomed when adults, once in at the labs starting in October and also start using some of the recorded versions. We did Zooms for Plato, which is what we're doing right now. And the archives went directly to YouTube. And then there was this issue of super spreading events, um, which is another pivot. I don't remember this from previous things, um, previous epidemics. Maybe they were, and I wasn't tuned to them, but this was a big deal to me. And this actually started with an event held by a biotech company in Boston um, way back in late February. And that this is an earliest example of, wow, there are events where the virus spreads and there are events that super spread. And this gets to the idea of not only the environment of the uh, event, but also who's at the event. And if some people have particularly high capacity to spread the virus. And so this affected how people look at um, what the dangers are of COVID and how they spread. Um, the issue of funerals, the issue of going to churches, the issue of singing at churches, all these things um, started getting people tuned to the idea that, well, not all events are created equal and you don't know which events are gonna be super spreaders. Of course, one of the most famous super spreader events was the uh, uh, events held at the White House for the new uh, nominee to the Supreme Court. And then um, vaccines have been amazing. Remember back on January 27th of 2020, not 2021, but 14 months ago, not two months ago, that panel at UW-Madison, the Speaker noted that vaccine development was already underway and that it was enabled by knowing the RNA sequence of the COVID virus and that expedited everything. Another thing that expedited was the urgency of the situation and that things that were usually done linearly in series were done in parallel so that you could um, on paper and end up proving that yes, you could um, explore, test, trial, approve and manufacture this stuff in record time. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything went as smoothly out here in the vaccination program as in testing and producing a vaccine, um, but it's still astonishing. So if you can remember on Friday, December 11th, that's when FDA granted the experimental use authorization to the Pfizer BioNTech 16 years or older, December 18th, a week later, uh, went to Moderna um, just a few weeks ago to Johnson & Johnson, which is the one shot version. There is this distinction between the supplies of vaccines versus capacity of vaccination infrastructure. And that raises the issue of ethics uh, and the logistics of vaccine allocation. The Wednesday night at the lab on uh, in two weeks is gonna be on the ethics of uh, of vaccine allocation. And this is something that I think is gonna be long studied um, in decades to come based on the experience that we've had this year. And then COVID in the wake of the insurrection um, is intriguing to me because of the, the high numbers of Capitol Police and National Guard folks who tested positive after the January 6th insurrection, including also eight members of 
Congress. Um, this is a relatively minor issue for an armed insurrection on the day that you're counting the votes for the Electoral College, but we're talking about COVID today and it's still a significant deal. And I'd like to end with the idea that uh, this email that was sent to me by a colleague, those who predicted this pandemic must feel an odd sense of satisfaction mixed with fear. Each day is a lesson in the principles of public health from infectious disease to health communications. Stay well and socially distant, Pat. Uh, this was sent in the middle of March last year. So with that, I'd be happy to say thanks for listening to my personal and professional saga. Um, I hope you had a chance to write down your pivots and divots and screw ups. Um, I'd be much more interested in hearing those. I'm happy to answer um, questions, but I'd be very interested to hear what your comments are and your um, experiences and your takeaways from your own living through this. Well, I worked in healthcare, so um, we were made aware already in February. Um, we were told that the first case was in Wisconsin was February 5th, and that was a person who had visited China, had come back from China. Uh, some dates in my mind was uh, uh, World Health Organization, I think it was World Health, called it a pandemic on March 12th. Uh, March 18th was our last day in the office. We were worked for a while and then we were furloughed and we were told to take um, unemployment for that period of time. And we were told that would be, we'd probably be coming back to the offices in September after Labor Day. Um, that didn't happen. We were brought back a week early. So we are working from home some of us did not have laptop computers, so we had to figure out a way to use our own through Citrix and different ways of you know, hooking into the, the system. Um, school stopped, we're raising a grandson. So he was, they, with Governor Evers changing the dates, it was just, you were getting so many emails on what was happening, and, you know, is school's going to continue until this day. No, school's not going to continue. Come get your stuff. You have to come, you know, we'll meet you at the door, that sort of thing. And then you had to pivot to school at home while I was working from home. Uh, luckily, we had good internet, so that wasn't an issue for us, and we had the space to be able to do that. Um, we are now working from home all the time, though we we're volunteering to, when it got really bad in wave two and three, I think, we were actually um, in clinic doing the test, not the testing, but the um, when you met people at the door, you asked them all the questions. So we were um, patient facing or some, I work in marketing, but we were patient facing because of that reason. Um, so we were volunteering, you know, this week you were working for this clinic, this week you were at this clinic, that sort of thing. Uh, and it was really busy and it was, it was not good. So uh, luckily nobody was infected that did that uh, patient facing working work. Um, that was a good thing. Uh, you would be surprised about the amount of people who didn't wear a lot of wear a mask walking into a clinic, really sad. Uh, we will continue to work from home. We now have swing offices. We're going to our offices at the end of March and we're going to clean them out, take our personal belongings. We'll have a swing office at a, another location, but for the most part, until further notice, and that could be forever, we will work from home. Um, so there's a lot of you know, ups and downs of what you're going to do and in decisions on, but it all got worked through. Um, you talked about divots. 
be uh, happy to see my family again, be happy to travel again, uh, be happy to be able to eat in restaurants again. I have a husband that's got comorbidities and he's very, 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 very careful. We didn't go anywhere. Luckily the year before in 2019, we bought a cabin up in North Central Wisconsin. So we stayed away from the cabin until summer. We did go, but we were very socially distanced from people. Uh, the cabins are not next to each other. There's space in between. So when we went up there, we bought our food in Madison. We got gas with gloves on and wipes and whatever. We stayed away from the local people. We did not eat in those restaurants, but that was a lifesaver. You talked about taking a vacation. That was our vacation. Um, let's see, screw ups. I went and had my hair cut and then the person who cut my hair tested positive for COVID. So I had to quarantine, was good. And I didn't get infected. We were wearing masks, but it made me really consider what I should and should not do. Uh, and then we should have wore masks much earlier than we did. So that was a screw up, I think. Um, but nobody in my family, direct family, except for one, became infected uh, with COVID. And that was a grandson who eight, was 18 at the time. Uh, and he was um, slight cold, like a cold, but he has asthma. So he's suffering with the after effects of it where he's winded. Uh, so, and I don't know how long that's going to take for him to feel better. And some days he's fine and other days he's just wiped out. He started college, he never had his graduation party. Um, but he did start college at UW Milwaukee in his room. He never, he attended one class. And so he, at the end of the first semester, decided to come back home. And his dad owns an HBAC business. So he's working there now just for the, you know, half money. And he, um, and he plan, intends on going back next fall, but um, he's on, kind of on hold now. He's okay with that. So I, in the midst of that, I have a 80, Two, yeah, 80 old, two old year old brother with stage four lung and bone cancer. So I haven't been able to see him. Um, he has to stay away from everyone. So I had the Hong Kong flu in 1969. I remember that. And that's what they called it at the time. Um, and that took me months to get over. I really had it really bad. I had like 104 and 105 temperatures. So nothing like this. This is just. Unreal. I remember on March 12th saying, like, supervisor, what next? And uh, we pivoted really fast. That's it. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. You're welcome. Herb, you've got your hand up. I do, and thank you, Tom. Um, let me say, first of all, I'm not going to respond uh, in the way that you requested us to. Uh, and I, I'm going to start by telling you my, my uh, credentials are that I had a 40-year career in public health, half of that time with CDC and half of it with the state health department. The last five years of uh, my employment up until 2007 was in pandemic planning. And it irritated me to no end when news reports would come out saying that this pandemic was a surprise to everyone. In fact, it was not. Um, and uh, the, one of the most bothersome things was that one aspect of our planning and working with hospitals was to, to set up stockpiles of emergency equipment, uh, PPE, respirators, uh, biologics, and those were replenished on a regular basis by having hospitals purchase from the stockpile what they needed for their usual uh, activity, and then the stockpile would be replenished. So when I heard that the, we, were, we, we, we didn't have any of the uh, necessary equipment, I called the director of the hospital preparedness program when I retired in 2007. He also had retired and he said, Herb, until I retired, all of those were working. However, within two years, they were all dismantled because the state thought the cost of maintaining the rent for the buildings to, to house these stockpiles was too much. So I, you know, that, that you can you can do the best that you can while you're there, but um, 
eventually you have to count on people who come after you to maintain these things. So I got it off my chest. Thank you for that opportunity. Tom, you're muted. Thank you for letting us know, Herb. And um, I have a saying that there ain't no structure like infrastructure and you still got to maintain it. And uh, it's got to be there when you need it. Other folks who'd like to share. Yeah, I um, one of the things I, you know, it seems sort of ironic, but I was really happy that one of the first cases in Wisconsin was in Madison because I knew that there would be people here who would get samples to start working on um, a vaccine or what to do about it because otherwise you had to get it from the CDC or somehow had to depend on the Trump administration. And I remember my, uh, my sister and her daughter um, still work at a care facility in Oconto, but live in Marinette County, which at the time, you know, we had cases in Madison and they had none in Marinette. And my sister was so concerned about me, but then it flipped and Marinette had a lot of cases. And as it turned out, my, um, at the care facility where they work, um, there were some people who didn't believe in masks and didn't wear them. And my niece um, suffered from COVID and she still has problems. She's about 40 and she still has problems um, breathing, getting her breath. And um, 13 of the 50 residents there died. So it was pretty devastating. Um, so if we would you know, I'm, I'm not sure what to do in those cases. She said, um, people don't believe in um, that COVID is, they think it's a hoax. And so they don't want to wear masks. <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, I just thought that I would throw that stuff out there. But I, you know, the irony is I was really happy that there was a case in Madison <laughs> of COVID if there was going to be one in Wisconsin. Thank you, Emma. Others? Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, I predicted, a, could have predicted a lot of things that would, would go wrong, especially with, uh, you know, with, with Trump in the White House. But I, I think what really disappointed me the most was just the, the level of the generalized anti-Asian violence that's just, you know, would pop up all over the place. That kind of surprised me. That it would be that uh, virulent. Uh, and I knew I would miss a lot of things. Uh, I guess the thing that surprised me, I really miss live theater. I didn't think I'd miss that that much, but I really do miss that. And uh, one thing that's kind of strange with everything else getting, getting canceled, I got uh, about an extra thousand miles of bike riding in last summer. So, so that's- uh, Oh, that was a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm really glad we're coming out the other end finally. Yeah. it's. Um... My mother-in-law has two shots. My daughter has one and is going to get another one. Um, I'm officially 75 now, so I'm going to go get one. All right, that's a fib, but uh, <laughs> very much looking forward to getting uh, immunized. Thank you. Other folks? Yeah, I... Um... My name's Kathy. I can tell you about uh, small business and impact on small businesses and a little bit different story than you probably have heard in the um, media. So we own a, a e-commerce business that we sell unroasted coffee beans and bulk teas uh, retail to consumers that roast their own coffee at home or you know, steep their own tea. Um, and we had been growing about 5% or so each year. They've been, in my it's my son and my husband own the business and they've been in business for almost 20 years now. They've been growing, you know, 5% or so each year. Well, when everything shut down last March, 
um, we were, you know, we're just going along on this steady growth path for this business, but it just exploded when everything shut down. So people were no longer going to work. They were no longer driving through um, Starbucks and weren't going out to meals and restaurants. So, and looking for things to do because they were at home, right? So there, I mean, you've probably heard about jigsaw puzzles and a lot of things that people do at home, those businesses exploded. Well, the same thing happened to us. And we tripled business in March of 2020. And we couldn't hire folks because no one wanted to work, right? I mean, you know, for fear of COVID. So it was just a uh, interesting story that we just happened to be one of those businesses that uh, went the opposite way of what, you know, has happened to so many small and medium-sized businesses throughout this pandemic. Um, the interesting thing is we don't know what will happen as people return to normal. So it's pretty hard to predict what will happen to our business um, this year and going forward. But it certainly was a surprise. Um, my husband and I worked from home be just because of our age. Um, and my son and the warehouse workers, you know, were continued to go to work, but they closed the doors to the public. And luckily, everyone has stayed healthy in the warehouse. Uh, nobody's uh, contracted COVID. So that was good. But very surprising. Didn't expect that. Thank you for uh, tuning us in. I'm glad things went favorably for you and your family. That's good. Others. Bia, why don't you tell us about what you ended up having to do? Sure. Um, so on March 11th, I got an email from UW-Madison saying study abroad programs were canceled. And so I was in the Netherlands um, for my semester abroad trip and I had to immediately fly home with all the other Americans uh, trying to flee Europe. So um, I got a flight out on the 22nd and it actually got canceled when I was at the airport. So then I was stranded at the airport for the night trying to find, um, trying to find a ticket home with everyone else. And it's crazy to think about because none of us were wearing masks at the time. And I think that was the last time I was in public without a mask on um, in the Amsterdam Schiphol airport. So then I got home, I quarantined for two weeks, and then I started working as a CNA again at a um, long-term care facility. And this facility was the epicenter of COVID cases in Grant County, Wisconsin, which is here on the map. <laughs> I'll do it again. Um, so unfortunately, quite a few residents died and a lot of my coworkers ended up getting COVID. I didn't, but it was still a very interesting transition from me supposed to being abroad to then becoming a, a healthcare worker in the, in the middle of everything. Yeah. Way to go. Other folks. I think one of the Paul Brandles has their hand up. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and you're still interested in having your hand up. I'm not Paul Brandle, but um, you get to I, just, today. <laughs> I just want to share some anger and frustration of the current situation. Um, I'm now feeling brave enough to have contractors come out to do some um, reciting in my house and some other projects. And I had somebody come yesterday and He had a neck gaiter on, not a regular mask, but you know, she kept pulling up and we talked and, and I was asking about the materials and whether they, how they were manufactured. Was there any change in green manufacturing of siding products? And he looked like he didn't 
have the faintest idea what I was talking about. And then told me how enduring these things were and they would last for, you know, two, 300 years. And then, um, so we talked, we got talking about COVID and she was telling me, yeah, his daughter had it, but she still doesn't have her sense of taste back yet. But he and his wife had this good deal. They just came back from Mexico and now they're going to be heading down to Daytona Beach for spring break. And um, he was really looking forward to it. And, and how he knew um, nurses and even police officers that weren't going to get the shot. And um, I have breathing problems. If I ever got exposed to COVID, I would be a dead, dead. <laughs> And I, I have a mixture of sadness and anger over that experience that I just, it's like, we're still not out of, you know, about the canals that bring water out in Arizona. And I mean, all these things. And, and you know, he lives up in Baraboo and, you know, people think, not everybody thinks the same way. And it was just such a horrible experience. And, and he left me with a legacy of who I want to choose and not choose to have side my house. Yeah. Have you been able to, get, can I ask, have you been able to get uh, immunized yet with your uh, breathing condition? Thank goodness I got my second shot and I just felt like this weight lifted off my shoulders. Yeah. And feeling brave enough to have somebody come out to my house for an estimate. I had all these things I'm way behind in that have been on my to-do list. And, uh, and then to have a, an interaction like that, when I first started feeling I could crawl out of my hole. Uh, just very well, emotional. Got, yeah. Uh, I know my wife was thrilled when her mom got her second shot and then the two weeks afterwards and the CDC announcement two days ago was basically the grandparents' rule. You know, if if you're fully immunized and got your two weeks after your booster shot, or one two weeks after your J and J, if it's one shot, one you can go ahead and go hug your grandkid, and that's a big deal. So, anyone else? Well, I have a question. Um, my husband was saying that he heard that the um, coronavirus was mutating and it was becoming um, less harmful. That they're, you know, that somehow the mutations are making it less um, able to infect people. Has anyone else heard that? I have not. No. I've only heard about the variants that are more contagious. Um, and some, the one in Brazil that can infect people who've already recovered from an infection. So it'd be good to have a gradually more mild version out there, especially if it would continue to spread because it would possibly, possibly help people's immune system crank a response against more virulent ones. Um, but I have not heard that. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all see a year in advance because I can. <laughs> um, it was very satisfying experience to go back and look at my emails. I save all my emails. I have 128,000 emails. And it's, and I'm not kidding, it, it's pretty amazing to just go back day by day by day by day, sometimes hour and minute at a time at that crunch period to see how fast things came down and changed and how foggy they were and how they got clarified or didn't. Um, but the weird thing is I still can't tell what's going to happen in five days or five weeks. So got to live it and find out. Thank you very much, Tom, for your time and effort and sharing. Yeah, it was yeah, a pleasure. Thank you. 
Yep. We'll see everybody next week and we'll get back to the research talks. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Tom.